taking in some rest and recreation in our R&R &R show. Lounging poolside with me are the really relaxed Susan Kalman. <laughs> the radiantly refreshed Lou Sanders. <laughs> the rigorously revitalised Stephen K. Amos. the reasonably rat-arsed Alan Davis. <laughs> now, don't forget to be mindful of your buzzers. Susan goes... You are an island, a desert island. Feel your troubles lapping away from your feet. I need to wee now. <laughs> <laughs> Lou goes... Listen to the sound of my voice as you experience deep relaxation. <laughs> Where is that person from? I mean, uh, Stephen goes. <laughs> Let your worries melt away and find your happy place. Let your worries melt away. <laughs> You'll be all right, love, all right? <laughs> Lead into death in an alleyway. <laughs> I love the idea of you as a relaxation app. I think that's... Oh, just get on with it, for God's sake! <laughs> and Alan goes... You are feeling Yeah. Yeah, excellent. Um, anybody favourite ways to relax? I like meditation to relax. I, well, I don't oh. do it now because I'm already enlightened, but I used yeah. to do it a lot. OK. Yeah, because I fell asleep a lot, but it was kind of meditation. And then... So that is just sleeping, you yeah. know that, right? Okay. <laughs> and I woke up once from a meditation, and honestly, I thought I could speak Portuguese. <laughs> <laughs> I was so sure that I could, and then I thought, oh, no, I don't even know the word for yes. <laughs> what about you, Alan? You like to go to the football, don't you? Yes, but I don't get relaxed at football. No. <laughs> if I want to have a nap, I'd go for a drive. <laughs> <laughs> OK. I've slept for 50 miles on the <laughs> <laughs> What about you, Susan? Are you a relaxer? Uh, smoking jacket, pipe, mantelpiece, uh, globe that turns into a bar, I like reading a load of Miss Marple of an evening. Just a very traditional ladies' evening. Uh, okay. And then a hand of bridge. Probably. Yeah. So no. just that kind of some brandy. Something. I know you. You yeah. count your Smurf collection. I do <laughs> count my Smurf <laughs> <laughs> It's more smurf relaxing collection. to be in a locked room or an unlocked room. What? <laughs> I think it's more relaxing for other people if you're in a locked room. <laughs> <laughs> that's interesting, you see, because some people think the door's locked, I'm fine. Mm. And other people think the door's locked, I can't get out. Have you ever done that thing of staying in a hotel and, and you wake up and you can't remember where the toilet is and you're naked? And uh, so you open the wrong <laughs> door. Anyway, I was in the corridor and the door closed. <laughs> <laughs> can't you just get under it? <laughs> OK, those are all good, but we have some ideas of our own about relaxation. <gasps> so, Alan, I yeah. know the absolute perfect thing to make you relax. Mm. Unfortunately, it was too big to fit under the desk. <laughs> Bring on the cow! <laughs> oh. 
So how might this cow aid relaxation, what do you reckon? Sit underneath it and get a pat on the head. <laughs> <laughs> so here's the thing, uh, you can cuddle a live cow in a farm in upstate New York, and weirdly called Mountain Horse Farm, but it's for cows. You pay $75 an hour and you can go and cuddle a cow. Do you want to give it a go, Alan? That is a lot of money to cuddle a cow. $75, $75 an hour. That's a lot of money. I know, but they assure you, and I don't know why they need to assure you, that the cuddling sessions are private. All oh, right, well, good. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I feel much better. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's all you need. You need some bloke in a flat cap. I'm not a big fan of the cow. I'll You're tell you, why? yeah. Because any creature that's got an eye there and there, yeah. it looks there. That's absolutely. <laughs> but if you look at the picture, I mean, it looks sweet, don't you think? But what is like... that cow actually doing? <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll find out when it inhales. <laughs> Susan, what have you got under your desk for relaxation? Is there nothing there? Is it this? What is it? What have you got? Stephen's uh, leg. It's <laughs> <laughs> not my leg. This? Yes. <laughs> oh. I'll be honest, Stephen, that wouldn't relax me. <laughs> what do you reckon? How would you relax with those? <laughs> Genuinely? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, so uh, this is a thing that you can pay money for as well. You would sniff it. It doesn't have to be an orange, it can be a lemon, or a, I particularly like a lime. <laughs> Smell it for a few minutes, and it's shown to reduce uh, stress and anxiety. So it's a very expensive clinic in the United States. The Mayo Clinic, they use this mm -hmm. as part of their aromatherapy. Do you feel, you know, feel a sense of the relaxation? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I think it depends on where the orange has been. Mm. Because... Stephen! <laughs> <laughs> What's another reason for perhaps sniffing an orange every now and then, apart from relaxation? To get space on the tube. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so here's the thing. You have to watch out for what's called olfactory dysfunction, mm. so the loss of the ability to smell anything. It's a really strong predictor as to whether or not a person is well. Indeed, it's a very strong uh, predictor of whether or not you might die from certain conditions, so things like uh, heart failure, cancer, lung <laughs> disease. Uh, <laughs> Can you smell it, Sue? No. It's nothing. Nothing at all. This isn't funny, I'm ill. No. <laughs> yeah, I think you're going to die. Um, yeah. So, the University of Chicago did some tests. Oh. <laughs> Can you smell it? I'm fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, they did some tests in 2014. Five oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, this one's all right. You're all right? <laughs> oh, that's a good. You're only going to die on one side. <laughs> Five years after they tested 430 people, 39% of the people who had a significant loss of smelling uh, had passed away. Ooh. I know, so it's a thing. It's like the canary in the coal mine. You've got to keep an eye on it. It's working here now as well. I don't think I was trying hard enough. <laughs> uh, Lou, what have you got to relax with? Uh-oh, it's yeah. rude. <laughs> it's rude? Why do you say it's rude? Well, straight away, my mind's whirring. OK. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to be polite on this one because my mum didn't like last time when I was did you, well, did you think you were a bit rude? <laughs> <laughs> Can you switch it on? Has it got an on-off switch? What is wrong with you? Yeah. It's just that bad. <laughs> <laughs> it might light up. No, it's another way of relaxing. So you could either use your own hand or you could use a... Yes. Oh. I'm afraid... <laughs> <laughs> Make your mother proud, girl. Make your mother proud. <laughs> <laughs> so, what I want you to do, uh, mm -hmm. and this is a method of relaxation, I want you to put the thumb into your mouth. It's absolutely. Oh! You see, I was. You were psychic. close. Yeah. Close your lips around it. Yeah. <laughs> and then I need you to blow Ooh. like this. And, <laughs> and then exhale. 
Is it like a bagpipe? Okay, so <laughs> so what it does is it this is a genuine thing to help you relax. It stimulates the vagus nerve. So that's the bit that's responsible for the body's relaxation response. And it is called the Valsalva maneuver. And what it does is it lowers the heart rate and it calms you down. I love it. Yeah. Did it make you feel any better? Um I mean you could do it with your own thumb, but obviously it's more I interesting. suck my thumb. Do you? Every night. Why? To a because point. I'm adorable. Like one of those. <laughs> <laughs> Like a sweet cigarette. <laughs> it's really <Yeah>. sharp now. <laughs> right, Stephen, what have you got, my darling? I have with me um, a concoction. Yes. Which is made up of PVA glue. Yep. And bicarb of soda. Okay. And I will add to that a little contact lens solution. Okay, because it takes a while to mix in, we've already put Red the bicarbonate pepper. of soda and the white glue together. Yeah. Add the contact lens solution, we're going to make some slime. Uh, Why might you make slime? Well, kids love it, man. They do <laughs> love it. Man, it's the feeling of okay, it. Okay, so this is a slightly worrying thing about the world. 2017 was a huge year for slime. How to make slime was the most popular how-to Google search in the whole of the UK that year. Wow. It was huge in the United States. It caused a glue shortage in the US. <laughs> and people watch people playing with it as a relaxation tool. It's this thing called ASMR, mm. Autonomous Sensory Meridian Response. So you get a sort of tingling relaxation feeling, and apparently you get it with slime. I like watching the ASMR videos. I like watching people touching things. Ooh. I think it's really nice. Uh, well, you're absolutely right. Apparently people like the predictable way in which things move. They like the fact that it's being manipulated. <laughs> Um, and we are... <laughs> it's, it's, it's... What colour have you got there? It, it started off... <laughs> it, it started off as quite, you know, alien-esque, scary green, yeah. and now it's kind of snotty. Yeah, but can you play with it with your hands? Can Stanley? I play with it? Yeah, well, so the idea is to watch... <laughs> watching you play... Maybe the spoon in it is not... <laughs> Videos like you're enjoying yeah, you it. I've seen those videos. Okay. I've got a life to lead. <laughs> Susan, can you show, show us? Yes, it? of course yes. I can. So what you do is you have oh. to, you have yeah. to kind of, you go, you go. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is that. It's just weird. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> The, the point of these videos is to display yeah. the enjoyment of the thing to the person, as if you're as if you're showing a prized child. <laughs> do you watch these things on YouTube? Yes, I do. Okay, yeah. so there's a woman. She's 26 years old. She's called Karina Garcia. She has nine million subscribers. Yep. Watching her play with slime, uh, she makes about two hundred thousand dollars a month wow. playing with slime. Uh, she also does things where she sees how many chicken nuggets she can get in her mouth. And, I mean, it's not for me. It, how many can she get in her mouth? It's a substantial number. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I could get 15. Oh, I... <laughs> I... I so wish we had chicken nuggets <laughs> right now. <laughs> The smell is quite relaxing as well. Is it? What's the yeah. smell of? It's good. I think it's the glue that's taken... <laughs> <laughs> taken you back. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm definitely not dead. <laughs> Bloody hell. <laughs> Shall we rustle the cow out of here? And many thanks to our farmer. Uh, well Thank done. You, farmer. Wild cow enthusiasm. <laughs> uh, who needs Valium when you've got citrus fruit and slime? Uh, <laughs> Time for a bit of a rest, but what one thing is guaranteed to ruin a good night's sleep? Cramp. Cramp? Do you get cramp? Oh, it's like being stabbed. Or maybe it was a stabbing. <laughs> I never sleep. I never sleep. I just don't sleep. Why? Because I can't sleep. I can't sleep at all. So everything ruins a good night's sleep for me. The single worst invention for sleep ever. Alarm clock. It is to do with the alarm clock. Oh. It's the snooze button. Oh. Uh, so here's the thing. You have resumed sleeping and your brain thinks that you have launched into another long sleep cycle mm. and then you unexpectedly wake up a few minutes later. It's unbelievably bad for you. You know about your REM cycles, mm -hmm. your rapid eye movement. These tend to be in the second half of your night's sleep and when you press the snooze button, your brain thinks, oh, let's start into another REM cycle. You interrupt it and you are left even groggier. I haven't set an alarm in years because I'm always up. I mean, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> but I get, I get, I 
you say just get up at half five and go downstairs and watch Murder, She Wrote? <laughs> or yeah. something like that. <laughs> um, but at least half of all sleepers hit the snooze button once every morning. Uh, those people who press it several times are the ones who sleep the least well, in other words, get the, have the greatest fatigue. Also known as students. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's rotund and makes a royal wretch? Something sort of chubby or round that's a bit smelly and lives in Buckingham Palace? Uh, no, so it is an actual place called a rotunda. I'm going to help you out here. It yeah. was in Leicester Square. It is, in fact, still in Leicester Square. Have anybody of you played the Leicester Square Theatre? I yes. have, yes. Okay, so yes. this is right next door and, you, and it's still there and you probably wouldn't even know it. So it was a purpose-built building, enormous building, uh, to display enormous paintings. So the largest paintings uh, of all time, gargantuan panoramas. It was an artist called Robert Barker. He, in fact, coined the term panorama. There he is. And he began with a view of London and he charged three shillings for you to come in and he made an absolute fortune and it was an amazing building so it was perfectly round it had a lower and an upper circle so that you could do two panoramas exhibited at the same time one above the other uh, the paintings were so large that you had to have a map uh, in order to find your way around it is now the French Catholic Church you can't see it because they've put a brick front on it so that's what it looks like now and you might have just walked past it it's between yeah. Leicester Square Theatre and the Prince Charles cinema but if you have a look from the air so say you looked at Google Maps or something, look at the size of it. Wow. Isn't wow. it fantastic? And if you look, there is a pull-out there, that is Leicester Square. Mm -hmm. uh, you can see where it's located and it's become a sort of hidden treasure in London. Change it to flats. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you wouldn't know it no. was there, which is amazing. Uh, anyway, just a few days before it opened, so we're talking about 1794, King uh, George III and his wife, Queen Charlotte, they were given a private viewing of a naval scene. It was so realistic and so overwhelming that Queen Charlotte, after she stared out at the painted ocean, she became seasick. I know how she feels, cos I went to the IMAX to watch Gravity with Sandra Bullock. Right. And is this a film, darling? Because that just sounds like a really boring it's thing a, to do. It's a film. <laughs> <laughs> you and Sandra Bullock <laughs> watching Gravity. Right. As a... You can't tell me. Wow. <laughs> Sandra! Sandra! <laughs> Miss Congeniality and Miss Congeniality 2, Armed and Fabulous, could not make me interested by doing that. But it was a film about space. It was just her. She was in her pants and vest. That's irrelevant to the story. She was in gravity. She was there. I was right up close because I couldn't get seats because I was late in booking. It's huge. It's the size of this entire studio. Wait, 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 wait. Why couldn't you get seats? You know Sandra Bullock. I've not understood this story. <laughs> I'm there. I'm sitting. She's right in front of me. It was so realistic that I vomited on myself in the cinema because I felt like I was in space with Sandra Bullock, who's a real person who was not doing that. She was trying to escape. <laughs> uh, I, think, I, think, I think it's fair to say, Susan, you definitely need some sleep. Yeah. <laughs> Don't vomit in space. Oh. <laughs> I've, I have vomited scuba diving. That's very bad. Oh, no. Yes. I was asked on a jet plane doing the loop the loop thing. Helmet, right? And I'm thinking, yeah, I can do this. You do a loop and <coughs> in the helmet. <laughs> okay, that's worse than. Yeah. At least I had the ocean for cleansing. Yeah. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Can't you see it's a very good film? And I just. <laughs> Stop for a minute, minute. I just I sometimes come on the show and then we move on and I don't feel like I've said what I need to say. <laughs> yeah, it's okay that I feel you've said what you've said. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying it's quite a good film. It's not as good on the telly, depending on the, I've got a 55 inch telly, so it's okay, but if you've got a wee telly, it's not You as could good. get in that. But <laughs> <laughs> To you, a 55-inch telly is like one of these panoramic pictures. <laughs> <laughs> Queen Charlotte definitely would not have enjoyed the panoramic scenes of another gentleman. Uh, they were of the Mississippi Valley, but they were by a man called John Banvard. Uh, they were known as moving panoramas. I don't know if you would have liked this. Nope. So these were from the 1840s, and instead of just having a thing where you stand and you look at the picture, they were on sort of rollers, and they were cranked around, and they had somebody explaining what the story was or what you were looking at. They were amazing. Uh, in fact, they were brought here to uh, Britain to be seen in a private viewing by Queen Victoria in early kind of moving pictures. Yeah. But the thing that uh, Charlotte suffered from, this 
sort of motion sickness by just looking at a picture. We sort of have it now. Has anybody ever felt sick playing a virtual reality game? Yes, I... I, I knew you would. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I played a game where you're um, in a plane, basically, and it was terrifying because it really fools your mind into thinking... Well, you... most virtual reality computer games, between 40 and 70% of people will feel sick. It's like the opposite of motion sickness. You know, if you're in a car, uh, you can feel the motion, but you can't see what's happening, and mm. so you feel slightly unwell. Uh, uh, this is the opposite. You see movement on the screen, but without the sensation of movement, and it makes you feel sick. You can even get sick looking at optical illusions, so the ones that appear to be moving. There's an amazing professor called Akiyosho Kitayoka, and he was from a university University in Kyoto and he designs illusions on his websites and he warns you if you look at them you actually can be sick even though the picture is not moving and if you are sick you should immediately cover one eye with your hand but don't close your eyes uh, because that could make the attack worse of you feeling it's like watching Good Morning Britain <laughs> <laughs> Let's all take a look at one and see uh, see how we feel. Uh, so this is called irrigation, and it appears when you are looking. It's a, mm -hmm. a completely static picture that there are rollers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, hands it does. up, hands up in the audience. You can see that the sort of thing is moving. It's actually moving. I mean, this is astonishing, isn't it? Even yeah. though it's a completely static picture. He discovered this while studying monkeys. <laughs> He's studying the work of the inferior temporal cortex, so the bit that does visual object recognition. And he came up with all these illusions. Have a look at another one. This one, I think, is actually slightly more... I don't know, disturbing is the right word. It's called rotating snakes. There it is. Oh, no. Is that a general thing? Who finds that one more disturbing than the previous that's, one? That's on the level of me looking yeah. at pictures of my ex-boyfriend. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Should I be concerned that uh, I'm not getting anything from... Nothing at all? No. Well, it's very interesting that, on the whole, women can see colour and shape better. So, so the women on the panel will probably be able to see it slightly better than you. But the there one are... you're staring at doesn't move, the ones around it It's move. the ones yeah, yeah. near it, isn't it? There are lots of things on the internet, Stephen, that will say you can tell how stressed you are by how much you can see it move. It's all nonsense. So you're absolutely fine. I wouldn't give it a thought. But, it, but for some people, that would make them feel extremely unwell. There's you're a... probably the other end of the spectrum. Oh, okay. There's a wonderful place in Keswick, the First Stop Pencil Museum Obs. Oh! Right. The Pencil Museum pencil is fantastic! Wonderful. It's wonderful. Yes. Were you in there with Sandra? <laughs> <laughs> museum they've got a place and it's up a wee flight of stairs and it's just this little kind of museum place and they've got one of those rooms that's at the wrong angle and the chairs up the way and you don't know until you step into the room right i, I couldn't even be in the room it's it just made the, me want to be sick the puzzling place yeah in keswick <laughs> i know right <laughs> the reason why i'm in charge um, <laughs> Now, let's put your bodies to the test. What's the least sportsmanlike thing you can do on a rugby pitch? What they used to do at school yeah. was put uh, deep heat in, uh, in the jock strap. <laughs> <laughs> Is deep heat a euphemism? No. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's a product. It's a product. That will warm up your genitals to a terrific degree <laughs> during a scrum. <laughs> I don't understand this picture because I don't know anything about rugby. But they're not playing rugby. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Tripping. You're not allowed to so, trip people up. You're not allowed to trip people. But this is a truly terrible thing, and I think it doesn't reflect well, frankly, on England. It was 1889. New Zealand's rugby team. They were fairly newly formed. Uh, they came over to play against England in a place called Blackheath, and uh, during the game, one of the English players, a man called Andrew Stoddart, he was tackled, and his shorts accidentally ripped off. So, very nicely, the Kiwi players uh, surrounded Stoddart to allow him to get back his modesty. Nice. Uh, while this was happening, another English player, a man called Frank Evershed, picked up the ball and scored a try. <laughs> I know, Lou, right? <laughs> scored a try, unopposed, which was allowed by the referee, a man called Roland Hill, who also happened to be the secretary of the English oh, Rugby <laughs> Football <laughs> Union. Three of the Kiwi players went off in protest. They were so furious. England won the game 7-0, uh, and the Kiwis were later forced to apologise for their players leaving the field. No. It's wow. not a good story, no. is it? No. no. Um, but I have a worse one. Uh, <laughs> so, almost 100 years later, so we're talking about 1986, the All Blacks, mm. they endured a crotch-related incident. <laughs> uh, so, there was a guy <laughs> called Wayne Shelford. He went on to be captain. In one of the first games, he ended up at the bottom of the ruck. He lost four teeth and a French boot ripped open his scrotum. <laughs> <laughs> Very low groan there. Um, <laughs> and left a testicle hanging out. Um, it was 
it was sewn together on the sidelines. <laughs> it played on until way into no. the second half when he was knocked unconscious. <laughs> he says he has no memory of the game. <laughs> what was the question? Uh, <laughs> the least sportsmanlike thing you can I would do. say that. That is very <laughs> unpleasant. Um, the force of tackling in rugby is quite extraordinary, and it was only recently quantified. Again, in New Zealand, the 2013, the Hutt Old Boys Marist Clubs, they used electronic mouth guards and behind-the-ear patches to measure the impact. So I'm just going to put this in context for you. Mm. Say an F-16 fighter jet roll, that's 9 Gs of force, OK? A car crash at 40 miles per hour is 35 Gs. The highest G-force recorded by this particular rugby club was 205 Gs. Mm. And according to the physician, there was no sign of cognitive injury to mm. any of the players. I mean, it doesn't say whether there was any cognitive ability before they started. <laughs> <laughs> Are you a sports person, Lou? Do you like sports? Mm, I like doing it. I don't, I, don't, I don't really like watching it. Not rugby, obviously. But, what do you um, play? Mm, actually, now I think about it, I don't think I'm a sports person. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the secret to succeeding at rugby is to try and try again. <laughs> That's one of two sporting jokes I've made in five years. <laughs> uh, what were the world's first roller coasters made of? Sturdy stuff. Sturdy stuff? Uh, mm -hmm. No, weirdly not actually oh. made of all that sturdy stuff. Wood. Uh, wood, some wood, but not entirely made of wood. What else might you use? Snow. What is more slippy than snow? Ice. Ice, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, <yeah. laughs> it's like, we're on the a... way, guys! I can do it! <laughs> Literally like pleasing a Labrador. <laughs> So the idea goes all the way back to 15th century Russia. So ice slides or flying mountains were built in several towns, including St. Petersburg. Uh, I mean, look, these are amazing. Uh, so some of them were 80 foot high. They were on wooden supports and then they were coated with water and they quickly froze uh, to a sort of slick, icy surface. Funny. And then they used to use hollowed blocks of ice lined with straw as the car to go down. Catherine the Great actually had one specifically built for herself at the Orenbaum Palace on the Gulf of Finland. And everybody thought these were marvellous. They quickly caught on around the world. They became known as Russian mountains. In fact, in Spain, I think they still call them uh, Montana Russa. They look like huge fun, do you not think? No. Nope. Yeah. Great. Yeah. No, no we'll not for me. Nope. No, I'm too, yeah, not I'm for scared. Me. Don't like the yeah. height. But you're not alone. So the pioneering American uh, roller coaster engineer, a man called Ron Toomer, he designed 93 of the world's roller coasters uh, by the time he died in 2011. He didn't like going on them. No. No, he said the very thought of it made him queasy. And this is what he did for a living. <laughs> well, I get that because I don't really like my comedy. <laughs> 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 Not as much as your mother disliked. <laughs> <laughs> no, but you're right to be afraid. So, in June 1911, the owner of Boston's Derby Racer roller coaster, he stood up in one of the cars to give a speech about roller coaster safety and <laughs> fell out. <laughs> <laughs> and he died. He died. I know. He died while giving a talk about be careful. Um, actually, this, uh, this is one of my favourite stories. Does anybody remember Fabio? Do you remember Fabio? Oh, yeah. Sexy Fabio. F sexy, sexy Fabio. Fabio. There he is, Sexy Fabio. Yeah. Mm. He was often on the sort of cover of romance novels. Anyway, he went on a roller coaster. It was the inaugural ride of this roller oh, coaster in this. Virginia. This oh, was in 1999. Yes. And he killed a goose with his face. <laughs> <laughs> When you do that, it's yes. sexy. Yeah. <laughs> do geese like roller coasters? No, the geese. No, it flew so into his face. It flew into his face. Here's the thing: is oh. that is that we're not really sure whether the goose flew into the roller coaster and then hit yeah, Fabio. Like, Fabio. <laughs> <laughs> Afterwards, he said it was very dangerous to go on roller coasters. This was clearly not a freak accident, and it would happen again. <laughs> as far as we know, it hasn't. <laughs> this is going to happen again. <laughs> it's a ticking time. <laughs> Well, I, I reckon if, if, if a bird did fly uh, in his face at yeah. that speed, yeah. you'd have had much more serious damage than that. It was probably pulling up, wasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> 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 no, imagine.
and it was right on my belly. Yeah. If, it was the, if it was the soft behind of a goose, yeah. then perhaps that would happen. You mean he was pursuing yeah. the goose? He was pursuing... <laughs> Went up a loop and went right round. How I wish you two had been the detectives on this case. <laughs> I'm coming for you. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Watch me get this good through my nose. So watch it. <laughs> <laughs> this could happen again. <laughs> Uh, what's a really ropey thing to do in a churchyard? Put for sale on the gravestones. <laughs> <laughs> I know, if you go and tell grievers that don't worry, there's plenty more fish in the sea. <laughs> <laughs> but what's the rope doing, Sam? Yeah, the rope is the critical thing. Right. Um, so it's to do with rope sliding. It was an 18th century spectacle as performed by steeplejacks. So obviously the people who. Ooh, ooh, ooh. So you, you climb up to the church <laughs> spire, you attach a rope to the peak, and then you attach one to the other end on the ground, and then you come down diagonally at a sharp angle. And a goose creams you. <laughs> 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 I mean, this one's got safety features. Release the bird! <laughs> <laughs> but it had a very, very high body count. I mean, lots of people died during this. Uh, so there's a famous guy, probably the most famous rope slider, he was called Robert Cadman. And loads of times in the 1730s he used to do this. There was a line from uh, St Mary's Church in Shrewsbury and he would attach a rope to that and then attach it to a tree in a place called Gay Meadow, which you might know uh, formerly the yeah, Shrewsbury, to be the football Shrewsbury Town Football Ground. He'd walk up the 250 metre long rope and then he had a wooden breastplate which had a central groove in it and he'd put that on the rope and he would chest surf all the way down. If they died, at least they're in the right place, straight into the cemetery. That is very <laughs> straightforward, yeah. There is actually a plaque on this particular church. It commemorates uh, Robert Cadman plunging to his death on the 2nd of February in 1739 when the rope broke. I did one of them. What? Zip slidey things across the Clyde. And did you enjoy it? No, because... <laughs> so it was for charity, obviously. Yeah. I don't like to talk about it, but I do a lot. <laughs> 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 so it's, it's the, there's a big crane at the Clyde. And you had to hang on yeah. while they unhooked you and hooked you. And I was there and I couldn't reach. <laughs> and I said, I can't reach. And the guy said, it's for charity. <laughs> <laughs> and it was horrible. It was really horrible. I didn't like but it. But actually, interestingly, there were quite a few female steeple jills, is what they were called. There's a marvellous woman called Lydia Atkins. This is a photograph wow. of her from 1913. She was known as the Lady Steeplejack of Leicester. She ascended a 150-foot chimney in Leicester in just five minutes. I mean, wow. she was amazing. And there were quite a few who disguised themselves as men. I like this story. There was a woman who disguised herself as a man to be, uh, in order to be a steeple jill. She was helping to rebuild Wakefield Cathedral, so we're talking about the early 1700s. And one day, she climbed to the top where she had an accident whereby her gender was exposed. <laughs> I mean, I have no idea. Mm. And this one is one of my favourites. This is an unnamed man. 1733, he rope slid from the top of the castle at Newcastle upon Tyne into Bailey Gate. And then he thought, that wasn't interesting enough, I'm going to do it with a donkey. <laughs> According to the local Newcastle <laughs> paper, the Newcastle Current, uh, the result of this was that accidents happened. <laughs> For the weights tied to the ass's legs knocked oh. down several, bruised others in a violent manner and killed a girl on the spot. I know! Just I know. another night on the big market. I mean, <laughs> Just unbelievable. Now, we're speeding off to the racetrack for a different sort of recreation. What happened when Pervs tried to reinvent the wheel? A three-wheeler, the thruple. They called it the thruple. The thruple. <laughs> That's a thing now. Yeah. Do you know any thruples? Sorry, what's a thruple? It's a three people in a couple. It's a thruple. No. It's like you, your wife and the cat. You are... <laughs> How's that joke go about the couple and they're not... He's complaining that they're not very sexually adventurous and he says, why don't we try the wheelbarrow? And, <laughs> and she says, all right, we'll, I'll do it as long as we don't go past my mother's. <laughs> <laughs> I can't 
remember how the rest of the joke goes, but that, <laughs> that's the end part. Yeah, <laughs> I think it's probably enough. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so this is a question about something called the Dinosphere. It was a creation of the physicist and electrification expert John Archibald, well, Pervs or Purvis, I'm not really entirely sure, and he revealed this single-wheeled vehicle to the public in 1932. So the design's rather simple. The driver's seat and the controls in the engine are sat on a carriage that slid on a sort of vertical loop of rails inside an outer carriage of the same shape. So the idea was that as the outer loop revolves, the inner one remains level. So there it is, that you would go along like this. It'd be rather nice. Um, you could get a top speed of uh, 30 miles per hour. Steering was a bit yeah. tricky because you couldn't really see where you were going. <laughs> and uh, so you had to sort of lean out mostly, in order to see where you were going. And the only way you could stop was to turn the engine off and roll to a halt. <laughs> How and... is this perverted? No, his name is per Pervs. Pervs. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I misunderstood the question. No. Were you waiting for some form of sex game to yeah. appear? Oh, so it's like a... Hmm. Yeah, there's a high risk of what's called gerbling. If you accelerate too sharply or you stop too suddenly, then the inner carriage was spun 360 degrees. Um, oh. So you'd be like a load in the laundry. Uh, <laughs> There's also something, Sandy, called yeah. uh, zorbing. Oh, yeah. You stand in this spherical ball that's right. made of some sort of plastic see-through material and there's some water in the bottom yeah. and they push you down a hill. Yeah. And people find this fun, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> I did it once, and once only. So the water was up to there. But, of course, as you're going round and round, it's all over you. So I, was, I thought I couldn't breathe. I thought I was going to die. I screamed, nobody heard me, I was in a ball. <laughs> That's like a terrible dream. I was screaming, but no one could hear me. I was in a ball. <laughs> uh, so it's been a dream for generations of people that the idea that there might one day be a mono-wheeled thing that we could uh, ride in doesn't seem practical. There was something called Hemmings Unicycle, or what was also known as the Flying Yankee Velocipede, uh, powered by a hand crank. But so far, nothing has happened in terms mm -hmm. of a one-wheeled thing. Now, it's time for the not-at-all-restful bit we call General Ignorance. We're going to speed through this. Fingers on buzzers, please. How do car thieves start cars? Happy, please. Hot wire. Hot wire. <laughs> Almost impossible to hot wire a modern car. Did you know that? Listen. Yes, <laughs> Lou, Lou. It's something to do with the wing mirror, and something in the wing mirror then triggers something else. Look it up. <laughs> Certain cars. Yeah. Uh, I can't go into it for legal reasons. <laughs> no. no. Well, what it is? Since the mid nineties, there have been all sorts of precautions. So there's a little chip in the key. I love chips. <laughs> If the car doesn't detect the chip, then the key isn't there, and then it won't start. Um, but there's all sorts of newfangled technology, and you can now use things like scanners and to clone radio signals from the keys, and you can, in fact, do it from outside somebody's house. So you could be outside the house with your scanner, and the keys are in the house, and they're all fast asleep, and you can still start the car. Basically, keep your car keys as far away from your front door as possible, or in a biscuit tin. Oh, yeah, because thieves do not like biscuits. <laughs> <laughs> The first car theft ever was committed by a woman. Did you know this? I love that. Yes. Uh, so her name was Bertha Benz. So married to. Um, oh, not the Benz of. The, the Benz, Benz of Mercedes Benz. Mr. Benz. Uh, Carl Benz. He had invented the very first practical automobile, and she thought he wasn't doing his best to sell it. So she decided that she was going to take it on the very first long distance journey. It was the 5th of August, 1888, and she took his car and she drove 90 kilometres from Mannheim to. Fourth time with her two teenage sons because she thought whilst doing this she might as well visit her mother. <laughs> what I, I love this about her. At one point she stopped at a cobbler's and asked him to put some uh, leather pieces onto, hammer them onto the brakes so that the brakes wouldn't wear out. And in doing so she invented the modern brake pad. Uh, so she's marvellous, isn't she? She yeah. was uh, mm. both a thief and an inventor. Yeah. Bet she couldn't park it though. Uh, <laughs> What? It's such a pleasure to see somebody doing so well on their last time on the... <laughs> The elves have done some research into your wing mirrors, Lou. Oh, yeah. Uh, in modern cars, if the wing mirrors are sticking out and it's empty, the key fob has been left in the car because they tuck themselves in when you leave the car. So you would know. It's not that you can hotwire the car through the wing mirrors, which is, you know, an interesting thought. <laughs> 
you've got your CDs, your MP3s, but vinyl just sounds so much better, do you not think? <laughs> <laughs> Alan, what do you reckon? Well, it does in a kind of nostalgic sense. But I don't know, does it sound better? I don't know. What do you no, mean? I mean, we definitively know now that it doesn't, it sound, doesn't better. sound better. So they did some research at uh, Tufts University. So LPs, for a start, have a smaller dynamic range. So that's the difference between the loudest and the softest sounds. The CDs have more than ten times the dynamic When they made range. CDs, didn't they find that you could hear things in the recorders that you couldn't previously hear? I mean, little things like fingers moving up and down fretboards, but also people screaming yeah, for help yeah. who were locked in cupboards. <laughs> <laughs> I used to think that the detail uh, of original recordings was on vinyl, and in fact it is not true. Uh, digital files are usually compressed, which means that you don't hear all those things, mm -hmm. but they don't have to be. And so you're right, you can hear all of those various things. And there's surface noise on vinyl. CD players use light beams, not needles, so you, dust is not a problem. Vinyl records also, there's an underlying low frequency rumble from the actual mechanics and the needle moving across the surface, they can unexpectedly vary in speed and pitch and so on. It says here, from any objective standpoint, said the researchers, there's no justification in calling the sound of vinyl records better. Yeah, but they're really good for rolling joints. <laughs> <laughs> it's time to move along. Uh, <laughs> how was the cat that got the cream? Ah! How was the cat that got the cream? Not oh. very well. Well, mm, yeah, not very well. Because cats shouldn't have cream and milk. They are lactose intolerant. Uh, <laughs> so, in order to be able to process the milk, they need the enzyme lactase in their digestive system. Obviously, as a kitten, you have lots of it because you get mum's milk. But then the lactase production rate slows down as they get older. Did you know, Sandy? What? That probably not. Human beings made cheese, and I read this in a cheese book. That I <laughs> <laughs> made cheese for a thousand years before they became lactose tolerant. Isn't that weird? They used to keep cows and make cheese even though they couldn't digest the milk. And then after about a thousand years of it, they were able to. Yes. People get very, very squeamish when you have a nice cup of breast milk in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> But it's fine to have it out of a cow's breast. I Why? It doesn't make any sense, does it, Lou? No. Well, um, the thing is, you don't gain anything nutritionally from having that kind of milk. Not even breast milk. But it is yummy. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, <laughs> adult cats are lactose intolerant. So let's look at the final results in last place. Well, this is extraordinary. This has never happened before. We have a triple uh, <laughs> placement of people in last place with... <laughs> Minus six, and this will give away who's the winner. Uh, with minus six, we have Stephen, Alan, and Lou. Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's thanks to our guests Susan and Stephen, Lou and Alan, and I leave you with an old American story about the risks of combining work with recreation. As she lay there dozing next to me, one voice kept saying, relax, you're not the first doctor to sleep with one of his patients, but another kept reminding me, Howard, you're a veterinarian. <laughs> Some of the best bits from the R series QI Thursday at nine. And if you enjoy sitting down in front of the telly, well, so does this family. Join the royal family by pressing red and watching them with BBC iPlayer for hours and hours.